Hi, I'm Kat Rosenfield. And I'm Phoebe Maltz-Bovey, and we are Feminine Chaos Blogging Heads Edition. Please be sure to check us out also on Patreon. Yeah, Patreon. For extra, slash Feminine yeah. Chaos. For extra pod, video podcasts and newsletters. Yes. All right, so I am uh, sitting on the floor in my apartment because in my usual recording place, I was being chased around by a horrible sunbeam that was uh, getting in my eyes and on my face. It was terrible. So uh, we'll see how this works out. And um, Phoebe, what are we discussing today? Um, well, and greetings from cloudy Canada here. <laughs> um Not bone-chillingly cold, though, as the New York Times recently referred to Canada in an article about the uh, less currently less royal royals moving to Canada. Um, Speaking of the New York Times, we are talking about, for starters, the controversy surrounding the novel American Dirt, which at this juncture, neither of us have read. I tried to get it out of the library, and it turns out that um, all five copies are on hold uh, for the rest of the millennium, I guess, basically. Everyone really, really wants to read this book um, in spite or maybe even because of the controversy surrounding it. Yes. So the book, um, yes, the the novel is called American Dirt. It is by Janine Cummins, and... It apparently, so as with uh, much in the realm, so it's it's one of these controversies where professional jealousy mixed with offensiveness or perceived offensiveness or perceived professional jealousy, these sorts of themes all play into it. So this novel reportedly got a seven-figure advance, which is... Enormous. Enormous. Um, I mean, I was excited when my book got a five figure. <laughs> so I, seven is a lot of figures yeah. for a book to be advanced. Obviously, everybody who has written so much as a sentence is going to be jealous. It's fine. You know, um, it also is, I guess, now an Oprah's book club pick it is yes um so, so that it's means gonna, that it'll sell and it's it'll being sell. made into a movie yeah so mm-hmm. this book is you know is going to be everywhere it's going to be a big deal um it's going to hit the bestseller list almost you know certainly and um yes. that's so that problem. that's set i feel like that's <laughs> necessary for background because it's about mexican migrants right it is a thriller Mm-hmm. About specifically about a woman whose family is murdered by the cartels who flees um, for the U.S. border from Mexico with her son. And so it's, um, you know, on top of being timely, um, it's also very exciting. And I think it's important to note that this is a genre novel you know it's not a piece of literary fiction and a lot of the objections sorry the cat um a lot of the objections to it are coming out of the lit fix sphere you know where you've got um people who are very serious about books, people who spend a lot of time talking about books, who are very serious about writing their own books, um, where there is a lot of conversation around, you know, sort of morality the morality of writing fiction um, of, you know, who's allowed to represent whom Mm -hmm. who's allowed to write which stories and so on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think an interesting path to this story, at least the one I took to it and found interesting was this kind of bizarre book review by Lauren Groff in the New York times, where she basically says that she was sort of, she liked the book, Sort of, but she didn't think she should. And it, she writes um, that she writes, I was sure I was the wrong person to review this book. I could never speak to the accuracy of the book's representation of Mexican culture or the plights of migrants. I have never been a Mexican or a migrant. In contemporary literary circles, there is a serious and legitimate sensitivity to people writing about heritages that are not their own because, okay. 
So, um, and then it continues. I was further sunk into anxiety when I discovered that although Cummins does have a personal stake in stories of migration, she herself is neither Mexican nor a migrant. Um, yet the narrative is so swift. I don't think I could have stopped reading. So there's a lot there. Like a lot, a lot. It's a a remarkable review because she clearly liked this book and felt like she needed to apologize for liking it. Well, it's also, she makes a lot uh, very much about herself and like, it's almost as if the issue, (laughs) and this is so like, this is so now, but like, it's not, the issue isn't um, the racism, but like the reviewer's personal sort of stance regarding like goodness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible to say, you know, I'm the wrong person to review this book because I can't speak to the authenticity of, you know, I don't know what it's like to be a migrant. Um, as she's though, reviewing it. Ah, she is reviewing yeah, it. She didn't she is say, reviewing it. she didn't say she, call out my friend who is also a book reviewer and is Mexican and or a migrant. She it's still did true. it. Yeah, she accepted ah. the money to, to wring her hands about accepting the money to do this, which is, I mean, what it's a, the ultimate know, privilege disclaimer is what a moment sort of like, like not actually passing the mic, but feeling, but saying she Talking feels bad. About, yes. Speaking into the mic about how bad you feel for not passing it. Oh gosh. I have, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this needless to say. Um, but you know, it is it is incredible to me that the line that you quoted could be written in a review today. You know, that like I was, you know, I was paralyzed with anxiety upon learning that the author of this book was, uh, you know, not uh, the, doesn't share an identity with the subjects of the book. You know, that she is not her characters. Mm-hmm. Like what? What a moment. Well, I mean, so I think some of it has to do with the novel itself, though. And that so this is later in the review. OK, so again, we haven't read the novel. I'm talking about what's in it via the review. So I'm quoting from the review now. Um, Groff's review. Um, there is a single clearer moral voice entirely on the side of the migrants because the book's purpose is fiercely polemical, which I would have understood even without the author's note in which Cummins writes that she intended, quote, to honor the hundreds of thousands of stories we may never get to hear. Um, so basically, okay, so end of that quote. It seems like a lot that's going on with this book has to do, though, with the book presenting itself in marketing materials, but also in this author's note, apparently, um, as not just fiction, not just fiction of a particular genre, but doing good. So the author's note mentions the fact that the author wishes that she were browner to be telling the story. It includes the fact that she did apparently a lot of research and like reporting, not reporting, but like sort of on the ground research for the story. Um, And basically, yeah, and that that it is, um, what is the... I feel like we talked about this always so much in grad school. And I'm only knowing what he's called in French. The roman at des, like the thesis novel, like the it's didactic to make a point. Mm-hmm. It's a book that does have an argument. So you can't entirely fault reviewers. I think when a book is held up as doing something good for migrants, you can't necessarily fault them for judging it on that basis and not just how good it is as a thriller. Which I think is something is an important aspect of this particular story that maybe separates it from some similar ones. Yeah, you know, it's it's difficult because I I think that this afterward um, was a mistake, and probably it's something that um, you know the, the publisher wanted her wanted to do because it would function as a sort of a privilege disclaimer. You know, it was going to preempt this criticism that they knew was likely to be coming. Um, you know, that she was not the right person to write this book because she's not a Mexican migrant herself. And, um, you know, I think, unfortunately, all this did was open the door um, and, you know, alert alert anybody reading um, that she was already feeling inclined to apologize for this, um, you know, really 
the, I think the, the future, at least I hope, is for publishers to realize that the only winning move in that game is not to play. Because as soon as somebody introduces that as a topic, um, oh, yeah. by, by apologizing for it, you know, it's like the door mm-hmm. has been opened and you cannot shut it. Well, yeah. So that's the thing with privileged disclaimers. Um, I, despite having been arguing this for years, people keep doing them and it's, ah, it's frustrating because like they just plant the idea of privilege. They plant the idea of the speaker's vulnerability to charges of privilege, you know, and that's exactly what's happening here. This notion of obviously the, and then, but then there's, of course, it's like the Louis C.K. story. There's also the big picture story of how somebody's doing outside of the, you know, five angry people on Twitter. And granted, New York Times book reviewers, but who knows? It seems like the book will itself will be fine and the author herself will be extra fine. But there's, I don't know. I guess, I guess I do wonder though, like, how much of this has to do with the fact that every book of every genre now has to claim not only to be sort of inoffensive, but like actively trying to do good. And yes. that, that sets things up for the criticism. Or I would say not every, every book, I think like <laughs> certainly I think the sort of like the big shot white male authors are kind of almost spared this sometimes that expectation, but that once a book, has any sort of identity angle, then it's like, it has to be doing good and it has to claim that. And then that claim in turn sets up this whole branch of criticism, which brings up this review that I'm obsessed with talking about, even though it's from like, or not a review, sorry, an essay from like a couple of years ago about um, criticizing straight women for writing erotica about gay men. And part of the criticism was that the, um, that these novels were being celebrated as like achievements in representation of gay men when it seems like the problem may not have been these novels, but the fact that they were being celebrated in that way. And I think I immediately thought of that in terms of this American dirt story, because like, is that, is the problem that it's offensive representations or is the problem that it's claiming to like be saving the migrants and is in fact a novel. Yeah. You know, I mean the, the thing about it being a thriller is um, I think, you know, where this idea of, of, you know, Oh, this is like offensive representation or an authentic representation, um, you know, to complain that American dirt doesn't represent like the nuances of, you know, an authentic migrant, um, experience is not totally that far off from these like complaining that the shining doesn't really represent, represent like an authentic hotel caretakers experience. You know, the, the book ultimately is supposed to tell a story, you know, and a certain kind of story, um, about, you know, about these people. And it, it, it does what a good thriller does. Um, in the same way that Gone Girl managed to tap into a couple of, you know, like kind of contemporary anxieties about the recession, um, about, you know, the impact of the recession on families um, on and on media and on marriages, and then also um, into the kind of like missing white woman narrative that was like such a big thing for a few years, you know, when people were just hooked on these stories. Um, you know, Gillian Flynn managed to take those and, you know, and, and play with these narratives and play with these anxieties and make it into a compelling story, a compelling story, you mm-hmm. know, not the only story, you know, she wasn't right. purporting to represent every, you know, every missing white woman. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Well, I'm going to give the counter argument though, which is that apparently, and this is where I wonder, like one hears so much about these sensitivity readers, but it seems like some of the criticism of this book from what I was just reading is that there are like details gotten wrong, like in terms of like the spellings of the names, they're like not how people actually spell names or whatever. And it seems like that, I don't know, like, I almost, this is more just like a sort of technical publishing question. I'm kind of like surprised that there would, you know, 
Like, I don't, I don't know. I have not fact checked that criticism. Seems plausible. I wonder how something could be so huge and there wouldn't be some sort of gatekeeping on that or like sort of like that they took the time to do an author's note where the author delves into her own whiteness, but not to like, see, is that how a name would be spelled in Mexico? Right. Well, I mean, to return to the, you know, the, the point, um, I think that like the difference between say gone girl and this is that it was being written at a time when now books are, you know, expected by somebody. I mean, not necessarily their readers, but I guess the people publishing them or the people marketing them, you know, there's this, this idea that you have to position it as not just a good story, but a necessary one. Um, right. You know, so you end up with this kind of this idea that, you know, yes, like this novel is polemical. It's not just about being entertaining. So, um, but, you know, to, to address like the criticisms, I think part of the, part of the problem is that this book has become such a flashpoint and so many people are kind of hate reading it, um, in this mode of like offense seeking, fault finding, you know, that it's really, really hard to know when you read a negative review claiming that she got all of this stuff wrong, whether it's really true or not, you know, like is, I mean, I, I, Found, I find this frustrating. It's one of the reasons that I really wanted to read the book before we talked about it. Um, that it's hard to know whether the criticisms are accurate or whether, you know, somebody is reading something into the prose in search of offense. Yeah, it, it is. It's also the, this question of like, is inaccuracy the same as offensiveness? And is getting details wrong. Like, I mean, I guess this is, this is where I just wonder about this whole sort of, again, this question of like sensitivity readers or whatever, like it, it used to be the assumption was that the novelist is one person with one set of experiences has maybe an editor, you know, um, but that there isn't that they don't, they're not, like no, they don't know every single thing about the entire world and they will get things wrong in terms of details. And that's not, that's not a sort of subjectivity to be transcended. That's just how it is. And I feel like right. there's now this notion that everything is going to have been fact checked down to the last detail. Um, which I don't know if that's like a good thing for fiction. It seems like, you know? Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that there's been this trend, like this transition um, from the assumption that the author is ultimately the authority on their characters and who they are and what they're thinking and feeling. Um, that used to be the case, and now there's an idea that's increasingly prevalent that if the author doesn't share certain identity characteristics with their characters, then they're not the authority on what their characters are thinking or feeling. Mm -hmm. Somebody who shares, you know, so, you know, these like census check boxes with the characters are a greater authority than the author mm -hmm. on what the characters oh. are thinking and feeling. Oh, this is reminding me of something that we have to discuss. It's tangentially related, but yet like really deeply related. The phenomenon of people saying, don't read this, read that on Twitter. And I'm thinking specifically of a tweet where somebody said, like, don't read Knausgaard's novels, read his wife's book or something. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, nobody's going to do that. No, not nobody. But it's just this sort of like the don't read X thing. Yeah. Well, you see, like, as if it's as if it's as if it's like somehow you're. It's like vote with your dollars but about literature and uh, I don't know about reading. Yeah. It just seems a little I mean, like people are like, don't read this book, read this memoir, you know, the, you mm -hmm. know, this from a small press from, from a real migrant. And like, I'm sure that it is a good book, but the person who's picking up American dirt because they wanted to read like the exciting thriller that Oprah picked is not going to, you know, they're not necessarily the same audience, you know, 
the idea that like you can't <laughs> that the you know the substitution for this book is you know a, a memoir that depicts the experience authentically like not everybody is picking this up i would say in fact few people are picking up this book imagining that what they're about to read is like a super authentic account of what the average migrant experiences yeah. when they flee for oh, the US. absolutely um but i also think like there's something about the sort of don't read this, read that, that <laughs> has the effect of ma- it, it's almost like an ad for the thing that's being said that you shouldn't read it. Cause it's saying, well, like, yeah, that might be like the higher quality thing, but you should really give this other thing a chance. You know what I mean? And it mm-hmm. kind of like ends up doing, it kind of backfires. Right. Well, that and people don't like to be told what to do. And if you tell them something, yeah. forbidden, you know, for they're sure. much more likely. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I don't think this seems like a book that I would probably be likely to pick up regardless, but, and I, I guess, um, I think, ah, I don't know. I think there's like too many things going on to make sense of it, especially without having read it. It seems entirely possible that it is like a tone deaf book. That seems possible. You know, that seems I don't think that that's a thing that doesn't exist. I think mm. that exists out there and it could be. Um, I also think that the moment there is such a thing as a seven figure book deal being discussed, this should have been me thing is going to hit, you know, and it's like hard to kind of disentangle these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I, I just do keep returning to this idea that every book has to now be um, doing something noble. And then when they sit, the moment the author agrees to that, agrees to those terms, mm-hmm. then they're kind of asking for that criticism and it's frustrating, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I really wonder, I wonder about this afterward. I wonder whose idea it was. I wonder if, if she did agree to it, the yeah, author, you know, like, but, she I mean, wrote it. like, being an author, I mean, you know, you know, this, like, it's, in some cases, you know, you're very much sort of at the mercy of what your publisher wants you to do. For sure. Um, For and sure. What, what I'm wondering is, you know, do, you know, whose idea was this? Did she feel like she could push back against it? Are male authors being asked to do this when they write ah, stories about characters that they don't share, you know, an identity category mm. with? And this is well, she wrote she wrote a New York Times op ed about her whiteness like a few years ago. And it does tie into that whole thing where like women writers are expected to share of themselves, even if they write fiction. Yes. And not to not to yes and you, but no, please, I, please. I think women writers and you know we, women in general um, are expected to be sensitive to criticism that they're taking up too mm. much space. You know, taking up space that doesn't belong to them. Um, you know, absolutely, like professionally and you know and physically, like you're not supposed to be too big as a woman. Um, but yeah, I think you know the 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 sort of idea that this criticism is like that women are open to this criticism just leads them to be targeted by it in a way that male authors aren't. And something that was really interesting to me was that um, the, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find this thing that I, I cut and pasted. Um, so Cummins was confronted um, during a Q and a Q&A session tied to the release of her book um, by people saying, you know, like, how do you respond to, you know, allegations that this is a stereotypical, like, white gazy, harmful work of fiction that, you know, you shouldn't have, that you shouldn't have written it. Um, and one of the things she said was, I think this is an important conversation. I feel like it is a question that needs to be directed more firmly towards publishers than at individual writers. I was never going to turn down money that someone offered me for something that took me seven years to write. And like when I read that, I mean, apparently this comment was met with applause and I wanted to applaud because like, yes, you know, this is ultimately the the thing is like, you know, you're, you're a working writer, you know, someone is offering you money for your book. Um, yeah. <laughs> man to apologize for that for taking the money i don't think 
So I feel like, I think I read responses to it online that were saying that that was a very white thing to have done. And I'm thinking, I think that's sort of pretty universal. I need to do that. Um, I mean, I think in the end, in a way like this does partly also come down to, it's like another one of these cases where there needs to just be more stories told. The publishing industry itself has a lot of issues and um, it shouldn't be that the only story that gets heard about Mexican migrants is this one. And I feel like the more legitimate criticism of it is more in that vein, if that makes sense. Like, yes. well, I mean, I guess I think, but then that's not really a criticism of that book. It's more a criticism of the publishing industry. Right. And like the um, worst case scenario is somebody picks up this book and, you know, reads this one story about Mexican migrants and never wants to read another one and thinks that this story is like, you know, the authoritative account. Um, and if one person thinks that, well, you know, they're wrong, but like they're allowed to be uninformed. Yeah, I'm not sure I, case, I buy the, the, oh, sorry, the best case. Yeah, the, the best, best case, case scenario ahead. is that this book fuels interest in migration as a topic and all mm-hmm. of the writers who are unhappy they didn't get a piece of this pie um, end up being discovered by people who are seeking more information, you know, people who get interested in the topic through this book, which is like your blockbuster thriller book, um, and are like, okay, cool, like, I read that story, now I want to read, you know, some real accounts from people who made this journey. Um, I want to read journalism from, you know, people who followed this journey. Like, it's, it's hard to see a downside, honestly, mm-hmm. to this story being published. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I saw about that was that it's the descriptions are so negative of Mexico that it would be something Trump would embrace. And I I think it's a little fantastical that Trump is picking up a novel and, and taking ideas from it of any, from any novel like this, but Anyway, Trump doesn't read. I mean, is the is I know, that, I know. It seemed like the notion that he's is, it, like, is, it, the, yeah. is the is the criticism but, honestly that like oh Donald Trump would like this book so it shouldn't exist. I'll need to do some Twitter digging after <laughs> our, our podcast. But it's I mean, something. That, yeah, no, but this I think was in some review. But I think we need to segue though to we do. another political topic because of the time. And oh my goodness, we have the most feminine chaotic. Yes. Political topic. Much like our age. Feminine Chaos, which features two women, mm-hmm. both, both equally qualified. No, you're, you know, you're so much more qualified to talk about this stuff. Oh, than come I on. I don't know who you are. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, you know. If you had to just endorse. <laughs> if, you had to, if you had to endorse one of us, would you just decide to endorse both of us? That would be the only <laughs> possible. Answer. If you were the New York Times, maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so why did the New York Times endorse two ladies? Ooh, ooh two okay. ladies. I think it's because they're cowards. <laughs> I think it's, it's because cowards? I think it's because they're cowards and they are more interested in being retroactively seen or even presently seen as having taken like the correct stance vis-a-vis the upcoming election than they are in the weight of their endorsement. Um, mm-hmm. as it might propel somebody to the White House, possibly because they don't think that that's a thing that's going to happen. I think that maybe this yeah. is a very, maybe. this is a very cynical move by the New That York could Times. be, that could be. So yes, they, um, the Times editorial board endorsed Klobuchar and Warren, um, claiming that the reasoning was that they're doing the radical and moderate ends of the Democratic Party because there are three path, possible paths ahead for the country, either Trump or these sort of left or centrist Democrat approaches, and because reason to campaign of the other Democrats, so it's going to be one of these women, and it's great that they are women because women, you know, um, are nice, as we could read about in Lauren Duca's fascinating article in The Independent about the feminine, right. or was it? The, I don't know. Feminine, feminine spirit or something that governs certain candidates, including Yang for reasons. Interesting. Although, of course, if you, re- if you read up on how Amy Klobuchar has reportedly treated her staff, she's not nice, reportedly. Right. She doesn't, she doesn't seem super duper nice. But anyway, um, 
endorsing two women seems to me like the ultimate in like gestures that want to be feminist and fail at exactly that. Like there's not going to be like women as president. It would be like one of them, (laughs) you know, it's like, you have to pick, you have to pick for an endorsement or you're not in, like, you can't vote. You don't vote for, you, you tick two boxes, your vote doesn't count. Like you can't, do that you have to pick and like that just seems so not it's so like it matters more to pick a woman than who it is taken to some sort of absurd place because like you can't pick two women you have to pick one of them and and it's like if you can truly only see the gender to the point that you pick two different oh i don't know it's just it seems so ridiculous yes so Thought big thumbs down to this move by the New York Times. I'm not impressed. Um, it, it does. It does seem yeah. like you know, in in choosing to do this the way that they did, they've essentially like nullified the any power that their endorsement might have had. And mm-hmm. you know, maybe maybe it's because they perceived and maybe perceived accurately that it wasn't going to do anything, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the response to this was going to be primarily about how it impacted the New York times rather than how it impacted the candidates selected. Um, Mm -hmm. but still Mm -hmm. like I would have appreciated them trying to put on the show anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, there's something like, okay. I I know what time it is and that there is not time to delve into like how people rehash 2016 and how there's that Hillary interview and oh my goodness. And all of this, but to tie it full circle instead to the podcast itself, um, I think there's something weirdly indirectly either Bernie or Biden endorsing about it where it's like, I don't know. There's just something about like, it just feels patronizing and it feels like the real candidates are the ones who wouldn't be endorsed in this phony way. I don't know. Ooh, yeah. I mean, maybe I just, maybe that I was know. the idea. <laughs> maybe the New York Times is playing like yeah. dimensional chess. I think so. No, I don't think it is. I think they just couldn't decide yeah. amongst themselves. Um, yeah, so that's that's the the Times and its feminine approach to endorsing. Yeah, a little chaotic, if you will. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> well, so, we've been feminine chaos. We have been, and we'll see you next time. You can check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash feminine chaos. Please do. And Bye. thanks for joining us. Bye.